This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Andrew's Ritual Church Service on the second Sunday after Easter. And let us pray. Lord Jesus, you promise that when two or three gather in your name, you are with them. Even when we are alone, isolated from family and friends, our church and her fellowship, you are with us, granting us every blessing that you won for us, forgiveness, new life, and eternal glory. Lord, calm our fearful hearts today as we gather around your word. Speak comfort to us, forgive our sins, strengthen us with the good news in the midst of these discouraging days, that because of your life, your death, and your resurrection, eternal victory is ours. Amen. A colic today. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given thine only Son to be unto us both a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life, give us grace that we may always most thankfully receive that his inestimable benefit and also daily endeavor ourselves to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our epistle reading this morning, this morning is taken from the second chapter of 1 Peter, beginning at the 19th verse. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in the body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. But by his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Here ended that first reading. A holy gospel according to St. John. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine, even as the Father knoweth me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord. And let us lift our prayers and petitions to God this day. Good Christian people, I bid you prayers for Christ's holy Catholic Church, the blessed company of all faithful people, that it may please God to confirm and strengthen it in purity of faith, in holiness of life, and in perfectness of love, and to restore to it the witness of visible unity, and more especially for that branch of the same planted by God in this land, whereof we are members, that in all things it may work according to God's will, serve Him faithfully, and worship Him acceptably. You shall pray for the President of these United States, and for the Governor of this State, and for all that are in authority, that all and every one of them may serve truly in their several callings to the glory of God, and the edifying and well-governing of the people, remembering the account they shall be called upon to give at the last great day. You shall also pray for the ministers of God's holy word and sacraments, for bishops, that they may minister faithfully and wisely the discipline of Christ, Likewise for all priests and deacons, that they may shine as lights in the world, and in all things may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. And ye shall pray for a due supply of persons fitted to serve God in the ministry and in the state, and to that end, as well as for the good education of all the youth of this land, ye shall pray for all schools, colleges, and seminaries of sound and godly learning, and for all whose hands are open for their maintenance that whatsoever tends to the advancement of true religion and useful learning may forever flourish and abound. You shall pray for all people of these United States, that they may live in the true faith and fear of God, and in brotherly charity one towards another. You shall pray also for all who travel by land, sea, or air, 
for all prisoners and captives, for all who are in sickness or in sorrow, for all who have fallen into grievous sin, for all who, through temptation, ignorance, helplessness, grief, trouble, dread, or the near approach of death, especially need our prayers. You shall also praise God for rain and sunshine, for the fruits of the earth, for the products of all honest industry, and for all his good gifts, temporal and spiritual, to us and to all men. And finally, ye shall yield unto God most high praise and hearty thanks for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all his saints, who have been the choice vessels of his grace, and the lights of the world in the several generations. And pray unto God that we may have grace to direct our lives after their good examples, that, this life ended, we may be made partakers with them of the glorious resurrection and the life everlasting. And Heavenly Father, we beseech thee to protect and defend our troops deployed here at home and around the world. Lord, we pray for the families and loved ones who wait their return. We beseech thee to strengthen and comfort those who suffer both emotionally and physically the scars of war. And Lord, we remember those who paid the ultimate sacrifice for the liberties and freedoms we enjoy this very day. And Heavenly Father, we pray for a just end to war. And now let us pray for our own needs and the needs of others. Heavenly Father, hear for the silent petitions of our hearts and the whispers upon our lips. We beseech thee, if it be thy will, to mercifully grant us these and all our requests that we humbly place before thee, through thy Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, brethren, summing up all our petitions and all our thanksgivings in the words which Christ hath taught us to say, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now our sermon this morning will be taken from the epistle that we read today, rather than the gospel. Take my lips, O Lord, and speak through them. Take our minds, O Lord, and enlighten them. Take our hearts, O Lord, and set them aflame. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I can't tell you how often I've heard people say over the past several weeks, God is trying to get our attention, or this is God telling us something, or God is sending us a message. And you know what? These people are exactly right. It's strange how God works, isn't it? It's sad, actually. It's sad that it takes a tragedy to get our attention, to get us focused upon God. But as the old saying goes, God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. So in the midst of this pandemic, let's talk about something most of us would rather not even think about, and that is suffering. We would rather not think about it or do it, but life comes with a certain amount of suffering. These past several weeks have certainly doled out its share of sadness and suffering. Our epistle text this morning tells us that part of being a Christian is suffering. We read, you've been called for this purpose. And what purpose is that? The verse just before our text says, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated you endure it with patience? But if, if when you do that it is right and you suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. God. It appears that, that you have been called for the purpose of doing what is right and suffering for it. Peter says, You are called to this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. All right, so everyone who's volunteered for suffering, raise your, your hands. All right, even though we're not together, I'm sure no one has. Now, everyone who wants to rise from their graves and live in eternity with Jesus, raise your hands. Well, I'm sure we could notice the difference in numbers. You and everyone else that you can't see right now is raising their hands. And yet all those who want to go to heaven are those who will also suffer. Except you didn't volunteer for that. You were chosen by God and created new in Christ Jesus for this purpose. Now I want you to take note that God does not want us to merely just suffer for the sake of suffering. God wants us to follow Jesus' example. You see, some in the early church thought the idea was to suffer, and so they invented ways to suffer. Some deliberately sought out trouble and persecution and pain. The monastic movement produced a lot of deliberate sacrifice and suffering. 
which they believed was praiseworthy and beneficial. But God isn't looking for you to seek out suffering. He is looking for you to walk in your faith in Jesus and do so deliberately. And if you do so, I assure you, the suffering will find you. God tells us through the pen of Peter that we are to follow the example of Jesus. That is our purpose. And what was his example? Well, we read, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. And while suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who he judges righteously. You see, the first part of the example of Jesus is, well, it's rather difficult. He committed no sin. And we are not able to exercise such perfect self-control. You see, the problem here is that because we know that we cannot, we often just give up and we do what we ought not to do. Sometimes we excuse ourselves. Sometimes we follow it up with an apology. And sometimes we laugh about it. And we act as though our transgressions were, well, amusing and muttering an oh well or to telling people they'll just have to take us as we are, full of our imperfections and all. And that's true, of course, but such an attitude suggests or perhaps outrightly proclaims that holiness is of no importance to us, even as followers of Jesus. However, that is certainly not the example of Jesus, now is it? The example of Jesus is holiness, not committing sins. We must be concerned with being holy. Of course, that doesn't mean that we have to be someone else's idea of holy. Our friends and our family, the media, our culture, they don't determine what is holy. Only the Word of God does that. Jesus many times did things that others took offense to, especially those things that ran counter to, to individual thought and, and individual feeling. Our goal as believers is to be God-pleasing, not crowd-pleasing. Jesus was also honest. There was no deceit found in his mouth. Jesus spoke the truth. And whether the people around him liked it or not, he spoke it. And he did not shade the truth to suit the hearers, and he did not bend it to his own advantage. We read there's, there was no deceit found in his mouth. We are also to be honest and truthful. We are to speak the truth and speak it always. The truth is absolute. And sadly, we don't have to look for circumstances in which speaking the truth is going to cause trouble for us or anyone else. I assure you, when you speak the truth, especially God's truth, you will begin to learn how to suffer. The example of Jesus is to speak and act honestly and rightly, no matter what the circumstances. And if you do, the circumstances will not always be good to you. If you act like Christ Jesus himself, he, Jesus himself has promised that the world will hate you and trouble will find you. Neither the, fear of, of, neither the fear of that happening to us nor the reality of any present persecution by the world around us should lead us to ab abandon our imitation of Jesus, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his footsteps. You see, this is the will of God, as is your salvation. They are connected but just the opposite of what most people would, would imagine. Your faithfulness does not result in or secure your salvation. It's just the opposite. Your salvation results in your imitation of Christ. If it were not for Christ having died for you and giving you new life, the world would not hate you. But because Christ did die for you and your sins have been forgiven, and because the Holy Spirit has taught you to believe, the world will persecute you. And because you have been set free from sin and death, your spirit now desires to be with Christ and like Christ. Sin is not what you want to do. Jesus did not allow the words or the actions of, of the evil ones around him to push him into, into bad behavior. He made no claim on his rights. He endured patiently. He didn't threaten anyone or curse anything like that. Instead, he looked to his faith and he kept entrusting himself to God who judges righteously. Being a faithful Christian means living in what you believe as a child of God. Do you believe that sin is bad, deadly, and that your sins have been forgiven? Well then if so, and you do not want to go back to your sin. You may stumble back into sin out of weakness, but you do not want it, and you seek the remedy for, for that immediately. And what is that remedy? That is, you repent and seek God's grace and forgiveness, and God is faithful to forgive. 
Do you believe, as Jesus has said, that God the Father loves you and is, as, and is intimately involved in your life right now? Then you do not despair, no matter what the situation. Rather, you trust God. You expect Him to bless and rescue you. And if He allows you to continue on in danger and persecution, you trust Him to sustain you and to accomplish His good and gracious will through your circumstances. That means that you trust God to take you and every aspect of your life, your finances, your health, your family, your isolation, whatever, whatever lays before you, and He makes it work out right, all according to His will. Now, it may not be what you want, it may not be comfortable, but it is in His hands and you trust Him to make it all work out according to His will for your blessing and salvation. And that is how we suffer. That is how we suffer, especially today, as faithful followers of Christ. That is what Jesus did. He died for your sins on the cross. And Peter writes that, that he did it so that you might die to sin and live to righteousness. You see, Jesus accomplished what he set out to do. He said so. He said, it is finished. You have died to sin in your baptism, for we are buried with Christ by baptism into death, and he who has died is freed from sin. That doesn't mean we don't sin. It means that sin is no longer the controlling factor in us or in our eternal destiny. Jesus has given us righteousness and gives us the power to live in it. And even though our flesh struggles mightily against it and leads us to sin daily, it is, however, just like Peter wrote in our text, by his wounds, that you have been healed. These words of Peter are law. You know, the, those moral imperatives as suggestions for a good life but they are not meant to accuse you or terrify you. They are meant to remind you and encourage you. Once you were wandering, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the bishop of your souls, as we read in our epistle. Now you are in Jesus Christ and in the flock of God. You see, this isn't a qualification heat. It's a reminder of who you are and how you got to be the very children of God and the members of his family. Because the price paid for you, for all of us, was very dear. And because the redemption he purchased with his own life is so sweet and so precious, we who believe choose to follow the example of our Savior. But we must do it as he did. We do it in the face of a very hostile word, world, a world that is opposed to all that Jesus offers. Let's take, for example, what's, what's happened in New York City. Just look at the antipathy directed towards Samaritan's Purse and their field hospitals set up in New York to help relieve the overstretched medical system in the face of this pandemic. That malice is all the result of and directed towards the volunteer workers' Christian beliefs and convictions. These Christians are derided and despised because they act in accordance to God's will, not man's deviant desires. And sadly, those in opposition to the work of Samaritan's Purse and the Christian workers they would rather see suffering and death rather than God's love and action. My friends, that is what real hate looks like. But we, we are to show the patience and the holiness and the love of our God in spite of such persecution. And we can do it, just as Christ did it, knowing that we cannot lose a thing. Even when we lose every worldly thing, if God is for us, who can be against us? God is with us in this world and through death into everlasting life. We cannot lose what God has promised to restore and replace and renew. We have no need for fear or panic. We should not feel alone or abandoned because God is with us to bless us and keep us. We are no longer, no longer like wandering sheep, open prey for every predator. But we are in the safety of the sheepfold of God, protected and strengthened, fed richly and loved deeply, with such great love that the shepherd himself laid down his life for each and every one of us. My fellow redeemed, the road of the Christian is not a smooth one, but by the grace of God we will endure. The Christian life, living in faith, serving God and neighbor, is difficult, and we will never quite measure up to our example, Jesus Christ. But it is he we strive to imitate, not man, and the world around us, even parts of the world in the visible church, will hate us and make it, make it hurt to be faithful. And as we follow our Savior's example, we will suffer frustration, pain, isolation, and sorrow. 
And when we do suffer, we need to, and we want to keep in mind the blessed outcome of the sufferings of Jesus. His sufferings, which are far worse than ours ever will be, bought us life, immortality, and eternal glory. And while we endure the troubles of life, which may come to us, we may be tempted to pitifully think of them as just pain and just trouble and just sorrow. But we want to remember, we need to remember, that we are the Lord's, we belong to Him, and it is because He endured these pains first that we can be assured that He understands and He has compassion and He will bless us and guide us and protect us and bring us through. He'll bring us through our current trials and those yet to come. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And let us pray. Grant we beseech the Almighty God that the words which we have heard this day with our outward ears may through thy grace be so grafted inwardly in our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruit of good living to the honor and praise of thy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. My friends, thank you for being with us today. And remember, be safe, everybody. Wash your hands and keep the faith, for this too shall pass. <laughs>